Welcome to your video on proportions. As you can see on the screen here, it's important that as you're watching this video that you're also listening. So make sure the sound is on on your earbuds. And then from time to time when we work through a problem, we're gonna be going fairly quickly, but realize you can just press pause at any time and work through things on yourselves or take more detailed notes. So we'd encourage you to do that. Okay, let's get started. We're gonna begin with some vocabulary that you're gonna be using during this proportional reasoning unit. Um, the first is a ratio, and a ratio is probably something that you've heard of before. It is simply a comparison of two quantities using division. There are a couple of different ways that you can represent a ratio. For example, you could use a fraction, like two-thirds. You could also use a colon, um, two to three, or you could write out the words two to three. So in any of the problems that you're given, you might just be given a straight up ratio as a fraction, or you might be given it in words. So be able to recognize all three forms. Now, when we look at ratios, oftentimes we wanna know how they compare to each other. And that's where the vocabulary word proportion comes in. A proportion refers to ratios that are equal. For example, one half would be equal to the ratio three over six. Because that is a true statement, that is considered a proportion. Another way that I want you to think about a proportion is as an equation. And the reason I want you to think about it as an equation is when we get to our solving equations unit, um, when fractions come in, sometimes students struggle, but if you can just view that equation as a proportion, I think it will be helpful because usually cross multiplying is something that students are pretty comfortable with. So an example of an equation that would look like a proportion, we would start with the one half, and then we might have a variable in it, say an X on the top, and then some other number on the bottom, um, we'll say six. So you could represent that same proportion up above, but then have a missing quantity and you'd have to solve that. And that's where we're going next. How do we solve a proportion? We're gonna use what's called a cross products property. And really that's just a fancy way to say cross multiplying. And that's gonna be how we solve proportions. Oftentimes the cross products property is represented like this. If you have two equal ratios, so the A over B equal to C over D, then what we know is that the cross products are equal. So when you cross multiply, you take A times D, and then you cross multiply in the other direction, B times C, and those two products will be equal. And remember that only works if you have a proportion. So we can use that idea to help determine whether a proportion is true or not. So even though there is an equal sign here, technically maybe we should have a question mark above the equal sign because we actually don't know. We're just gonna be testing. So one way that you could do it is to check the cross products. So we could do three times 48, which gives us 144. And then we would check the other cross product, four times 36. And when you type that in your calculator, you would see that you get 144. So this would be considered a true proportion. But sometimes you need to know whether things are proportional. And so you don't necessarily wanna set up an equation if it's not gonna be true. So another method, and I'm actually gonna encourage you to use this method to determine if something is true or not, is just to check the individual ratios to see what they equal. Um, so basically divide each ratio. So you know that 3 fourths is equal to 0.75. And if you don't remember how to get that, you just type in your calculator three divided by four. It's always the top divided by the bottom. Then you check the other ratio, 36 over 48. And when you divide that out on the calculator, you see that that is also 0.75. So the fact that those two ratios are the same tells you that you have a proportion. So let's try both methods on this second equation. So again, we're not quite sure that they're equal, but we're gonna be testing. So we'll do our first cross product, 12 times seven. And when we type that in, we discover that that is 84. On the other cross product, we're looking at 19 times five. And when you figure out what that is, you get 95. And as you know, 84 is not equal to 95. Hold on here. Apologize for the delay here, we just lost connection. 
and we're back, sorry. So 84 is not equal to 95. So this is a false statement, which means that this is not proportional. Um, but again, I think the easier way to figure that out would just be to divide out your two ratios. So start with the 12 over 19. And if you put that in a calculator and just divide it out, you get 0.6315. And it's up to you how many decimals you want to take. Um, looking at the other ratio, you have 5 over 7. And when you take 5 divided by 7, you get 0.7143. And that right there tells you they are not equal, so it is not proportional. So cross products are helpful, however, I think dividing the ratios is going to be the way to go. All right, now let's actually solve a proportion. Um, when you solve a proportion, you've probably done this before in earlier math classes. I know sometimes students refer to things as the fish method or they just do some fancy drawings and they, they magically get an answer. But we are going to stick to cross multiplying, which means we're going to use our cross products property. So we are going to start, um, and a lot of times, I know we've always kind of multiplied in that direction first, but students are most comfortable with the variable on the left-hand side. So we're going to switch it up and do our other cross product first. We're going to do the 4 times y. So we're, And it doesn't matter because they're equal, so you can start with either cross product. So we've got 4 times y equals 4y. And then on the other side, we have 6 times 82, which gives us 492. Now, this is just a simple one-step equation. In order to isolate the variable, um, right now we have 4 times y, so we have to do the opposite. So we're going to divide both sides by 4. That reduces to y, and then when you divide that out, you get 123. Okay, moving on, the next problem, we've got another variable up there, but there's a number in front of it. No biggie. We're just going to incorporate that with our cross products. When you do 5a times 2, you just multiply those coefficients together. So the 5 times the 2 gives us 10, and then that number just goes in front of the A. On the other side, 3 times 15 gives us 45. And then just like before, we have a one-step equation. You will divide both sides by 10. So A is 4.5. And you are allowed to give a decimal answer. All right, now to the good stuff. Everyone loves word problems, right? So what we're going to do here is we're just going to spend a lot of time. In fact, most of your practice is going to be focused on the, the reading and the word problems and being able to set up a proportion. So what we're going to do is we're going to look first at what is the ratio or what quantities are we comparing? And we're always going to establish that first. And then based on that, we're going to develop our proportion and then solve. So if we look at this problem, it says the goal of the Hartford Library is to have two books in stock for every five residents. So that's some key information. It, it looks like we might be comparing books to residents. Then it goes on to say the population of Hartford is about 13,000. And then it asks us to find the total number of books that the library should have in order to meet the goal of two books for five residents. So we have some things that we want you to think about first. I mentioned we want to have that ratio. So I'm going to be comparing books to residents. And once you've established that ratio, that's going to determine how your proportion is going to be set up. The other thing I want you to think about at the beginning of a problem is, what are we actually solving for? What is our unknown? So we're going to do what's called defining the variable. And we'll just use x, pretty common letter to use in algebra. And we're going to let x be the number of books, because that's what we're trying to find. So according to my ratio, I need books over residents. So we underlined some stuff in the problem. We have two books for every five residents. So that is going to be our first ratio. And then we're going to set that equal to, on the other side, we have to do books over residents again. Since we don't know the number of books, that's where the x is going to go. And then on the bottom, we have to put the residents, and we're estimating uh, the population is about 13,000, so that's going to go on the bottom. Sometimes students just throw fractions together and put variables in wherever they feel like it, but you have to be very intentional and always focus on that ratio at the very beginning. So we are going to solve by cross-multiplying, and like I mentioned before, it's helpful to have the variable on the left-hand side of the equation, so we're just going to start with that cross-product. We have 5x and then we'll take care of the other cross product, and we'll get 26,000. We again have just a simple one-step equation. We're going to divide both sides by 5, 
and we learn that we should have 5,200 books. Um, it's good to write an answer statement as well. Sometimes when you solve for a variable, it's not always going to be your final answer. In this case, it is, but you still want to write a sentence for your answer. So we'll say the library should have 5,200 books. And that's where our label comes into. Then we know what that 5,200 is. All right, let's take a look at another problem. This time we're looking at sugar cookies. It says a recipe for sugar cookies calls for four cups of flour. The recipe will make about 36 cookies. So just looking at these first two sentences, it looks like we're comparing cups of flour to cookies. And then the question says, how many cookies can be made with nine cups of flour? So we always are kind of have four things and three of the things we're gonna know. So we're gonna start with our ratio. Like I mentioned before, we're comparing cups of flour to the number of cookies. And then the unknown is going to be how many cookies. So this is gonna help us set up our proportion. So if we're comparing cups of flour to cookies, our first ratio has to be four over 36. Then we're gonna set up the rest of our proportion uh, we have to stay consistent. Cups of flour has to be on the top. So we put the nine, and then this time the X is gonna go on the bottom because that represents the number of cookies. We're going to, again, use cross multiplication. And since um, we want that X on the left-hand side, we're gonna start with the four times X. And then on the other side, 36 times nine gives us 324. We solve this again by dividing both sides by four. And we solve for X, which is 81. That tells us you can make 81 cookies. Nice little answer statement here, making sure that we're actually explaining what our X means. Another common application with proportions is comparing heights to shadows. In fact, if you ever take our um, forestry class here, I've seen students out in the back of the school measuring some of the, the trees that are in our, our school property um, using this exact method. So we have a five foot tall person and we know that they cast a shadow that is 12 feet long. So looking at those two numbers, we are comparing the height of a person to the length of a shadow. Now we have a monument that we know the shadow of that monument is 30 feet long. And what we want to figure out is how tall is that monument. So the ratio that we're going to start with here is the height of the object. So the object being either the person or the monument. And we're going to compare that to the length of the shadow. The unknown for this problem is the actual height of the monument. So we'll start with what we're given, the height of the object. So that would be our person. So we're going to start with the five over the shadow for that person, which is 12. On the other side, we are going to put the X because we don't know how tall that monument is, but we do know that the shadow is 30 feet long. And think about that. You know your height. You can physically measure your shadow. You could physically measure the shadow of the monument, but you couldn't really scale the monument to measure the height of it. So this is a really helpful method in figuring out how tall something is without actually having to get to the top of it. So my recorder here is already working on the problem. We are going to start with cross multiplying. So we have 12x. And then we're going to do our other cross product. And we've got 150. We solve our simple one-step equation by div dividing both sides by 12. And we get 12.5. So this tells us that the monument is 12.5 feet tall. If you wanted to get really fancy, you could say 12 feet six inches, but we'll allow you to go 12.5. All right, last problem here. Marshall ran 13.4 miles in two hours and 15 minutes. At this speed, how long will it take him to finish a marathon, which is 26.2 miles long? Give your answer to the nearest minute. Now, there's something a little bit tricky about this problem. It looks like we're comparing miles to time, and that is indeed true but you are given the time in kind of a tricky way here. So what I want you to do is circle that two hours and 15 minutes. And I'll tell you a common mistake is students are gonna call that 2.15 hours, which is not the case because there are not 100 minutes in an hour. So what you have to do is you have to convert that. So what we're gonna take is we're gonna do the 15 minutes 
and we're going to divide that by 60. And you get 0.25, which should make sense if you look at a clock. 15 minutes is a quarter of an hour. So what we're really looking at here is 2.25 hours. You have to make sure that you have everything in just one single unit. You can't put hours and minutes into your problem. So now when we're looking at the distance and the time, we'll, we'll compare those two things. And we have our time just given in hours. And our unknown this time is how long it's going to take Marshall to finish the marathon. So again, we're looking at x for time. So our first ratio, we're going to put the distance 13.4 over the 2.25. And then on the other side, we have to keep the distance on top. So we'll put the 26.2 over our variable x. We will cross multiply. We'll start with the variable. So 13.4x equals 58.95. Now you'll notice we have quite a few decimals in these problems. So if you have not purchased your calculator yet, make sure you head to a store and get one tonight. All right, we're going to divide both sides by 13.4, and we come up with x equals 4.399. Now, we're going to take a label on this. This is hours, and if you look at the directions, it says give your answer to the nearest minute. So just like we converted the minutes to hours, now we've got to kind of go backwards. So we know that we have four full hours. We're just going to take that 0.399, and we're going to multiply that by 60. And I suppose you could round that to 0.4 as well. But um, when you type that in your calculator, you get it's approximately 24 minutes. So our final answer would be um, Marshall would take 4 hours, 24 minutes to run the marathon. And then that does answer the question when it says give it to the nearest minute. All right, this concludes your video on proportions. Your assignment now is to work in your packet and practice the proportion problems. There are quite a few, and most of them are word problems. So what we want to see is the ratio and the variable, and then, of course, all your work.